Welcome to the series of lectures in group theory. In this lecture we'll be looking at Wilson's theorem. Last time we discussed the notion of invertibility modulo a particular integer. So fix a non-zero integer. We say that an integer a is invertible modulo n if there, there is an x such that this congruence equation holds. So it is a very simple or not a very simple but uh, it's a very useful criterion to check invertibility that if I'm given an integer a and some positive integer n then a is invertible modulo n if and only if n and a are relatively prime meaning GCD of a and n is 1 alright and we saw that inverses are unique modulo n so th what that means is that suppose a is an inverse sorry um, a is an integer and x is an inverse of a modulo n then of course x plus n will also be and in fact everything in the same congruence class everything in this set will also be an inverse of a modulo n what this means is that these are the only things that are inverses of a modulo n so once you have found an inverse you know every other inverse you just take any element in the congruence class you get another inverse and that is the only way to get other inverses okay these are the problems uh, I'll be using this problem so that is why I marked with a star typically in textbooks star mark problems are supposed to be harder than the rest but no in my case I just mark things with a star uh, if I'm going to use it uh, in the present lecture sometimes I forget to mark them but uh, most of the time I think I'll remember so what is this saying? It's saying that suppose you have a prime and suppose that for each x uh, not divisible by p there is a... Uh, okay sorry I misread it so we have a prime p we want to show that for each x not divisible by p there is some unique x prime in this range such that x is congruent to x prime modulo p so what that what that is trying to say is the following in case of primes not being divisible by a prime and being relatively prime to that prime is the same thing so you can read the problem as follows show that for each x relatively prime to p or in other words invertible modulo p there is a unique x prime in this in this range uh, such that x is congruent to x prime modulo p so everything that is in invertible modulo p can be kind of represented by something in this range and uniquely so you cannot have two different things here which which are congruent modulo p of course so uniqueness is not the hard part in fact uh, nothing here is hard it's just you can just use division algorithm or whatever you like but I just wanted to wanted to prime you to this uh, fact and you can look at the previous fact before you get to this problem anyway I would like you to solve all the problems okay uh, so before we state the Wilson's theorem we have a very simple preparatory lemma let me bring a grid for this purpose so we want to show that if P is a prime and we have some X which satisfies this congruence then that X will satisfy this congruence and conversely the converse is trivial if something is satisfying this congruence then clearly it satisfies that congruence but let us just prove this direction so assume we have x square is congruent to 1 modulo p then x square minus 1 is congruent to 0 modulo p which is same as saying that p divides x square minus 1 which means p divides x minus 1 times x plus 1 which means that p divides x minus 1 or p divides x plus 1 so this is where this the fact that we are, we are working with the prime comes in if p were not a prime we couldn't say that anyway so therefore uh, I mean, if, if you write this in terms of congruence and that in terms of congruences you'll see that this means x is congruent to 1 mod p or x is congruent to minus 1 mod p 
which one can write succinctly as x congruent to plus minus 1 mod p. So very simple fact and very simple proof. Okay. And uh, one should be able to see that this is false if you replace p with some non-prime thing. And I would encourage you to find an example. It's very simple. Okay. So, this, a very simple corollary of the previous thing is that if p is a prime, then if you choose an x in this range, which is its own inverse, so choose an x such that x is its own inverse, then x is either equal to 1 or x is equal to p minus 1. And this is immediate from the from the previous thing because uh, if x is its own inverse, then we have x square is congruent to 1 mod p. Why? Because x times x is congruent to 1 mod p. That's what it means to be its own inverse, which, which means x square is congruent to 1 mod p which as we saw in the previous lemma is that this is same as saying x is congruent to plus or minus 1 modulo p and uh, this since x is in this range this uh, congruence implies that x is either 1 or p minus 1 so there's no point in me writing out all the details but this is a very simple corollary that we will use so here is Wilson's theorem So let P be a prime, then this congruence holds is the statement of Wilson's theorem. P minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo P. It's a strange looking theorem, but it's uh, the proof is very nice. And it can be useful at times. Anyway, so for all... Uh, sorry, what am I saying? I will prove this uh, theorem only for this particular prime, this, but this is true for all primes. Uh, and I will let you, whatever is the reasoning, once you follow this reasoning, you'll be easily able to generalize it to arbitrary primes, and that will be an exercise. So let us just see the idea in this particular example. So I've listed out all the numbers less than p. So these are these are all relatively prime to p, and as we saw that if you pick anything else relatively prime to p, it is congruent to one of these guys here, and exactly one of these guys here. That is very important. Okay. So let me just try to record... Uh, which number is inverse of what? If I pick something here, it has some inverse in, in integers because each of these are relatively prime to be. But I can always find one guy here, exactly one guy here, which which is also an inverse. So we can s sort of restrict ourselves to this set in, in terms of taking inverses. Okay, so it will be more clear what I'm trying to say. So 1 is its own inverse, I'll just put, put that in, it, in, in a blue island. And 10 is its own inverse, I'll put that in a blue island. Again, remember that p is 11. Okay, now what about 2? Now 2, 6 is 12, so 6 is the inverse of 2, right? 3, 4 is 12, 12 leaves the remainder of 1, modulo 11. 5 9 is a 45, 44 plus 1, and this is 9 is inverse of 5, and 8 7 is a 56, which is 55 plus 1, and hence 8 is inverse of 7. So we've recorded these relationships. And what I would like to say is that if you, you know, take any arbitrary prime and do this, you will have partitioned this much, which is what? Which is 1 up to p minus 3. This gets partitioned into double tons. Double tons meaning sets of size 2. So this gets partitioned into double tons such that each double ton is con consists of an element and its inverse. So why, why is it that uh, this partition happens? It's because if A is an inverse of B, then B is an inverse of A. That's why you get double tons. So if you join an edge from an element to its inverse, of course, it, it kind of go, goes both ways. So this is taken care of and then the rest, you cannot have that uh, 6 will be an inverse of 3 now or, or something else because inverses are unique uh, modulo p within this range. So This is what that exercise was all about. 
Okay, so six cannot be inverse of two different things basically. It can be inverse of exactly one thing in here. Okay, uh, so so this this kind of this kind of structure will appear for any prime p. And what the idea here is now that instead of writing ten factorial as this product. Ten factorial is eleven minus one factorial, which is which we will write as well. First, we have two islands, one and ten. Those are two islands. We'll care about them later. But now we will use this partitioning. So, two times six, three times four, five times nine, and seven times eight. So we just shuffled things around and grouped them according to this kind of data. And the advantage is once we go modulo p, so since this is an equation, we can go modulo p and this will still be true. So I can just write a modulo p and put this symbol here. And the the key idea is that all of these things leave a remainder of one, meaning they are all congruent to one modulo p, and hence the right hand side just becomes one times ten, meaning ten modulo p. And when I say p, I mean eleven, which is congruent to minus one, modulo eleven. And of course, the left side is ten factorial, so ten factorial is congruent to minus one modulo eleven. We did not have to compute ten factorial, which is a big number. So this is the reasoning. This generalizes to any prime, and I formally write it as an exercise. Okay. I hope you follow this this particular thing. It's not not a difficult thing to follow, but the idea is very very nice. It's not an obvious thing. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to say. Uh, as usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.